the extract from the Yodel Diary, from which I have just read, may indeed show that some of the German generals at that time were cautious with respect to Germany's ability to take on Poland and the Western powers simultaneously. But nonetheless, the entry shows no lack of sympathy with the Nazi aims for conquest. And there is no evidence in Yodel's diary or elsewhere that any substantial number of German generals lacked sympathy with Hitler's objectives. Furthermore, the top military leaders always joined with and supported his decisions with formidable success in those years from 1938 to 1942. So if we are told that German military leaders did not know that German policy toward Czechoslovakia was aggressive or based on force or threat of force, let us remember that on 30 May 1938, Hitler signed a most secret directive to Keitel, already in the transcript, 388 PS, US 26, in which he stated clearly his unalterable decision to smash Czechoslovakia by military action in the near future. The defendant Yodel was in no doubt what that directive meant. He noted in his diary the same day that the Fuhrer had stated his final decision to destroy Czechoslovakia soon and had initiated military preparation all along the line. And the succeeding evidence, both in the Schmunt file and the Yodel diary, shows how these military preparations went forward. Numerous examples of discussions, plans, and preparations during the last few weeks before the Munich Pact, including discussions with Hungary and the Hungarian general staff, in which General Halder participated, are contained in the Yodel diary and the later items in the Schmuth file. The day the Munich Pact was signed, 29th of September, Yodel noted in his diary, 1780 PS, the entry for 29, 29 September. The Munich Pact is signed. Czechoslovakia as a power is out. Four zones as set forth will be occupied between the 2nd and 7th of October. The remaining part of mainly German character will be occupied by the 10th of October. The genius of the Fuhrer and his determination not to shun even a world war have again won the victory without the use of force. The hope remains that the incredulous, the weak, and the doubtful people have been converted and will remain that way. That's the end of the quotation. Plans for the liquidation of the remainder of Czechoslovakia were made soon after Munich. Ultimately, the absorption of the remainder was accomplished by diplomatic bullying in which the defendant Keitel participated for the usual purpose of demonstrating that German armed might was ready to enforce the threats, as shown by two documents already in, from which I need not read, 2802 PS, US 117, and 2798 PS, U.S. 118. 
And once again, the defendant Yodel, in his 1943 lecture, L172, US 34, tells us clearly and in one sentence why the objection of eliminating Czechoslovakia lay as close to the hearts of the German military leaders as to the hearts of the Nazis. Quote, the bloodless solution of the Czech conflict in the autumn of 1938 and spring of 1939 and the annexation of Slovakia rounded off the territory of Greater Germany in such a way that it then became possible to consider the Polish problem on the basis of more or less favorable strategic premises. End of quote. And this serves to recall the affidavits by Blomberg and Blaskowitz, which I have read from. The whole group of German staff and front officers believed that the question of the Polish corridor would have to be settled someday, if necessary, by force of arms, they told us. Hitler produced the results which all of us warmly desired, they have told us. I turn now to Poland. <coughs> the German attack on Poland is a particularly interesting one <clears throat> from the standpoint of the general staff and high command. The documents which showed the aggressive nature of the attack have already been introduced by Mr. Griffith Jones of the British delegation. I propose to approach it from a slightly different angle inasmuch as these documents serve as an excellent case study of the function of the general staff and high command group as defined in the indictment. This attack was carefully timed and planned, and in the documents, one can observe the staff work step by step. Mr. Griffith Jones read from a series of directives from Hitler and Keitel, embodied in document C120, GB41, involving Fall Weiss which was the cover word for the plan of attack on Poland. That is a whole series of documents. And the series starts C-120. The series starts with a reissuance of a document called Directive for the Uniform Preparation for War by the Armed Forces. We have encountered this periodically reissued directive previously. That was a form for sort of standing instructions to the armed forces laying out what their tasks during the coming period would be. In essence, these directives are firstly statements of what the armed forces must be prepared to accomplish in view of political and diplomatic policies and developments. And secondly, indications of what should be accomplished diplomatically in order to make the military tasks easier and the chances of success greater. They constitute, in fact, <clears throat> a fusion of diplomatic and military thought. And they strongly demonstrate the mutual interdependence of aggressive diplomacy and military planning. Note the limited distribution of these documents early in April 1939, in which the preparation of the plans for the Polish war is ordered. Five copies only are distributed by Kite. One goes to Brauchitsch at OKH, one to Raider at OKM, one to Göring at OKL, <coughs> and two to Varland in the planning branch of OKW. 
Hitler lays down that the plan must be susceptible of execution by 1 September 1939. And as we all remember, that target date was adhered to. The fusion of military and diplomatic thought is clearly brought out by a part of one of these documents which has not previously been read. That is D, C-120, subdivision D. Be found at page four of the translation. <coughs> the subheading is Political Requirements and Aims. German relations with Poland continue to be based on the principle of avoiding any quarrels. Should Poland, however, change her policy towards Germany, based up to now on the same principles as our own, and adopt a threatening attitude toward Germany, a final settlement might become necessary, notwithstanding the pact in effect with Poland. The aim, then, will be to destroy Polish military strength and create in the East a situation which satisfies the requirements of national defense. The Free State of Danzig will be proclaimed a part of the Reich territory at the outbreak of the resulting British cautiousness might produce such a situation in the not too distant future. Intervention by Russia, so far as she would be able to do this, cannot be expected to be of any use for Poland because this would imply Poland's destruction by Bolshevism. The attitude of the Baltic states will be determined wholly by German military exigencies. On the German side, Hungary cannot be considered a certain ally. Italy's attitude is determined by the Berlin-Rome axis. Subheading two, military conclusions. The great objectives in the building up of the German armed forces will continue to be determined by the antagonism of the Western democracies. Paul Weiss constitutes only a precautionary complement to these preparations. It is not to be looked upon in any way as the necessary prerequisite for a military settlement with the Western opponents. The isolation of Poland will be more easily maintained even after the beginning of operations if we succeed in starting the war with heavy, sudden blows and in gaining rapid successes. The entire situation will require, however, that precautions be taken to safeguard the Western boundary and the German North Sea coast, as well as the air over them. End of the quotation. But no one suggests that these are hypothetical plans, or that the general staff and high command group did not know what was in prospect. The plans show on their face that they are no war game. But to clinch the point, let us refer briefly to Mr. Alderman's so-called pin-up document on Poland, L-79, U.S. 27. These are Schmutz notes on the conference in Hitler's study at the Reich Chancellery Berlin on 23 May 1939, when Hitler announced, and I quote just one sentence, there is, therefore, no question of sparing Poland, and we are left with the decision to attack Poland at the first suitable opportunity, end of quote. Note who was present beside Hitler 
and a few military aides. The defendant Goering, CNC of the Luftwaffe. The defendant Raider, Navy. The defendant Kaiser, OKW. Von Brauchitsch, CNC Army. Colonel General Milch, who is State Secretary of the Air Ministry and Inspector General of the Luftwaffe. General Bodenschatz, Goering's personal assistant. Rear Admiral Schneewind, Chief of the Naval War Staff. Colonel Yashanik, Chief of the Air Staff. Colonel Varlamont, Planning Staff. All of them, except hey. Milk, Bodenschatz, and the adjutants, are members of the group. So far, these documents have shown us the initial and general planning of the attack on Poland. These general plans, however, had to be checked, corrected, and perfected by the field commanders who were to carry out the attack. I offer document C-142, which will be U.S. 538. This document was issued in the middle of June, 1939. And in this document, von Brauchitsch, as Commander-in-Chief of the Army, passed on the general outlines of the plan for the attack on Poland to the field commanders-in-chief to the Oberbefehlshaber of army groups and armies so that the field commanders could work out the actual preparation and deployments of troops in accordance with the plan. It's from page one of the translation. I quote, the object of the operation is to destroy the Polish armed forces. <coughs> High policy demands that the war should be begun by heavy surprise blows in order to achieve quick results. <coughs> the intention of the Army High Command is to prevent a regular mobilization and concentration of the Polish Army by a surprise invasion of Polish territory and to destroy the mass of the Polish army which is expected to be west of the Vistula Narva line. <coughs> I skip to the next paragraph. The army group commands and the army commands will make their preparations on the basis of a surprise of the enemy. <coughs> there will be alterations necessary if surprise should have to be abandoned. These will have to be developed simply and quickly on the same basis. They are to be prepared mentally to such an extent that in case of an order from the Army High Command, they can be carried out quickly. <coughs> End of the quotation. What is the date of that, uh, that document? The date of that document is in the middle of June 1939. The precise date, I believe, is the 15th or 14th. 1939. June, do you say? June, yes, Your Honor. <coughs> the date is on the original. The next document is 2327 PS, which will be US 539. It is signed by Blaskowitz. 
dated 14 June 1939. And it shows us an Oberbefehl's harbor at work in the field, planning the attack. Blaskowitz, at that time, was commander of the Third Army Area Command, and he became commander-in-chief of the German Eighth Army during the Polish campaign. I read some extracts from this document, found on page one of the translation. The commander-in-chief of the army has ordered the working out of a plan of deployment against Poland, which takes into account the demands of the political leadership for the opening of war by surprise and for quick success. The order of deployment by the Third Army, by the High Command, known as Fallweiss, authorizes the Third Army Group, which in Fallweiss, its Eighth Army headquarters, to give necessary directions and orders to all commands subordinated to it for Fallweiss. And I skip paragraph, paragraph seven on page one. The whole correspondence on Fall Vice has to be conducted under the classification top secret. This is to be disregarded only if the content of a document in the judgment of the chief of the responsible command is harmless in every way, even in connection with other documents. For the middle of July, a conference is planned where details on the execution will be discussed. Time and place will be ordered later on. Special requests are to be communicated to Third Army Group before 10 July. I, that is signed, Commander-in-Chief of Army Area Command 3, F. Blaskowitz. I skip to page two. Read one further extract. Under the title, it's the top of page two of the translation, Aims of Operation Fall Vice. <coughs> the operation, in order to forestall an orderly Polish mobilization, is to be opened by surprise with forces which are, for the most part, armored and motorized, placed on alert in the neighborhood of the border. The initial superiority over the Polish frontier guards and surprise that can be expected with certainty are to be maintained by quickly bringing up other parts of the army as well as to counteract the marching up of the Polish army. Accordingly, all units have to keep the initiative against the foe by quick acting and ruthless attack. End of the quotation. Finally, a week before the actual attack on Poland, and when all the military plans are laid, we find the group, as defined in the indictment, all in one place. In fact, all in one room. On August 23rd, the Oberbefehlshaber assembled at the Ober Salzburg to hear Hitler's explanation of the timing of the attack and for political and diplomatic orientation from the head of the state. This speech has already been read from at length. It is found in 798 PS, US 29. And I pass over it, except to note and emphasize that it is addressed to the very group defined in the indictment as the General Staff and High Command Group. It is, incidentally, the second of the two examples referred to in the affidavits by Halder and Braukic, numbers one and two, 
which I read earlier. We have now come to the point where Germany actually launched the war. Within a few weeks, and before any important action on the Western Front, Poland was overrun and conquered. <coughs> German losses were insignificant. The three principal territorial questions mentioned in the Blomberg and Blaskowitz affidavits were all solved. The Rhineland had been reoccupied and fortified. Memel was annexed. Polish Corridor had been annexed. And a good deal more, too. <coughs> Austria, a part of the Reich. Czechoslovakia occupied all of Western Poland in German hands. Germany was superior in arms and in experience to her Western enemies, France and England. Then came the three black years of the war, 1939, 1940, and 1941, when German armed might swung like a great scythe from north to south to east. Norway and Denmark, the Low Countries, France. Italy became an ally of Germany. Tripoli and Egypt, Yugoslavia and Greece, Romania, Hungary, and Bulgaria became allies. The western part of the Soviet Union overrun. I would like to deal as a whole with this period from the fall of Poland in October 1939 to the attack against the Soviet Union in June 41. In this period occurred the aggressive wars in violation of treaties charged in the indictment against Norway, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, Yugoslavia, and Greece. I cannot improve on nor add much to the presentation of these matters by the British delegation. From the standpoint of proving crimes against peace, the case is complete. But I would like to review this period briefly from a military standpoint and view it as the German military leaders view. And of one thing we may be sure, neither the Nazis nor the generals thought during this period in terms of a series of violations of neutrality and treaties. They thought in terms of a war, a war of conquest, a war for the conquest of Europe. Neutrality, treaties, non-aggression pacts, these were not the major considerations. They were annoying obstacles, and devices had to be formed and excuses manufactured to fit the circumstances. Von Blomberg has told us in his affidavit, which I have read, that after 1939, some generals began to condemn Hitler's judgment methods and lost confidence in his judgment. Which particular Hitler methods some of the generals condemned is not stated, but I think the tribunal will not hear any substantial evidence <coughs> that many of the generals condemned the march of conquest during the years 1939 to 41. In fact, the evidence is rather that most of the generals were having the time of their lives during those years. Six weeks after the outbreak of war and upon the successful termination of the Polish campaign, on 9 October 1939, there was issued a memorandum and directive for the conduct of the war in the West. This is document L-52, L-52, and becomes U.S. 540, 540. It is not signed. 
distributed only to the four service chiefs, Keitel, Braukich, Goering, and Rader. From the wording, there is every indication that it was issued by Hitler. I will read the pertinent extracts. Starting with page two of the document, about two-thirds of the way down the first paragraph. Starting with the words, the aim of the Anglo-French conduct of the war. The aim of the Anglo-French conduct of the war is to dissolve or disintegrate the 80 million state, that being Germany, again, so that in this manner, the European equilibrium, in other words, the balance of power, which serves their ends, may be restored. This battle, therefore, will have to be fought out by the German people one way or another. Nevertheless, the very great successes of the first month of the war could serve in the event of an immediate signing of peace to strengthen the Reich psychologically and materially to such an extent that, from the German viewpoint, there would be no objection to ending the war immediately, insofar as the present achievement with arms is not jeopardized by the peace treaty. It is not the object of this memorandum to study the possibilities in this direction, or even to take them into consideration. In this paper, I shall confine myself exclusively to the other case, the necessity to continue the fight, the object of which, as already stressed, consists, so far as the enemy is concerned, in this dissolution or destruction of the German Reich. In opposition to this, the German war aim is the final military dispatch of the West. That is, destruction of the power and ability of the Western powers ever again to be able to oppose the state consolidation and further development of the German people in Europe. As far as the outside <coughs> world is concerned, However, this in internal aim will have to undergo various propaganda adjustments necessary from a psychological point of view. This does not alter the war aim. It is and remains the destruction of our Western enemies. I pass to page three, the translation, paragraph two, under the subheading Reasons. The successes of the Polish campaign have made possible, first of all, a war on a single front, awaited for past decades without any hope of realization. Page three of document L52, paragraph two of that page, subheading reasons. That is to say, Germany is able to enter the fight in the West with all her might, leaving only a few covering troops. The remaining European states are neutral, either because they fear for their own fates or lack interest in the conflict as such, or are interested in a certain outcome of the war, which prevents them from taking part at all, or at any rate too soon. The following is to be firmly borne in mind. And at that point, I interpolate here, there is a succession of references to countries, and I pass to Belgium and Holland at the foot of page three. Belgium and Holland. Heading Russia, heading Italy, Belgium.
That's page four, Your Honor, isn't it? It's the previous page. Belgium and Holland, right. <clears throat> Both countries are interested in preserving their neutrality, but incapable of withstanding prolonged pressure from England and France. The preservation of their colonies, the maintenance of their trade, and thus the securing of their interior economy, even of their life, depend wholly upon the will of England and France. Therefore, in their decisions, in their attitude, in their actions, both countries are dependent upon the West in the highest degree. If England and France promise themselves a successful result at the price of Belgian neutrality, they are at any time in a position to apply the necessary pressure. That is to say, without covering themselves with the odium of a breach of neutrality, they can compel Belgium and Holland to give up their neutrality. Therefore, in the matter of the preservation of Belgo-Dutch neutrality, time is not a factor which might promise a favorable development for Germany. The final paragraph to be read is the Nordic States. Provided no completely unforeseen factors appear, their neutrality in the future is also to be assumed. The continuation of German trade with these countries appears possible even in a war of long duration. <clears throat> End of the quotation. Seven, eight, nine. Six weeks later, on 23 November 1939, our group, as defined in the indictment of Oberbefehlshaber, again assembled. The document is 789 PS, 789 PS, which is already in the record as US 23. The Oberbefehlshaber assembled and heard from Hitler much of what he had said previously to the four service chiefs. This speech, part of which is already in the record, contains other portions not previously read which are now of interest. And the first extract, which I would like to read, it's on page two of the translation, about halfway down in paragraph one. <coughs> Starting with the words, for the first time in history, we have to fight on only one front. I quote, for the first time in history, we have to fight on only one front. The other front is at present free. But no one can know how long that will remain so. I have doubted for a long time whether I should strike in the east and then in the west. Basically, I did not organize the armed forces in order not to strike. The decision to strike was always in me. Earlier or later, I wanted to solve the problem. Under pressure, it was decided that the East was to be attacked first. If the Polish war was won so quickly, it was due to the superiority of our armed forces. The most glorious experience in history. Unexpectedly small expenditures of men and materiel. Now the Eastern Front is held by only a few divisions. It is a situation which we viewed previously as unachievable. Now the situation is as follows. The opponent in the West lies behind his fortifications. There is no possibility of coming to grips with him. The decisive question is, 
How long can we endure this situation? Passing to page three of the document. Line three. Everything is determined by the fact that the moment is favorable now. In six months, it might not be so anymore. Finally, passing to page four. Page four of the translation. The long paragraph about halfway down, beginning, England cannot live without its imports. We cannot feed ourselves. We, we can feed ourselves. The permanent sowing of mines on the English coast will bring England to her knees. However, this can only occur if we have occupied Belgium and Holland. It is a difficult decision for me. None has ever achieved what I have achieved. My life is of no importance in all this. I have led the German people to a great height, even if the world does hate us now. I am setting this work on a gamble. I have to choose between victory or destruction. I choose victory. Greatest historical choice to be compared with the decision of Friedrich the Great before the First Silesian War. Prussia owes its rise to the heroism of one man. Even there, the closest advisers were disposed to capitulate. Everything depended on Friedrich the Great. Even the decisions of Bismarck in 1866 and 1877 were no less great. My decision is unchangeable. I shall attack France and England at the most favorable and quickest moment. Breach of the neutrality of Belgium and Holland is meaningless. No one will question that when we have won. We shall not bring about the breach of neutrality as idiotically as it was done in 1914. If we do not break the neutrality, then England and France will. Without attack, the war is not to be ended victoriously. I consider it as possible to end the war only by means of an attack. The question as to whether the attack will be successful, no one can answer. Everything depends upon the favorable instant. End of the quotation. Thereafter, the winter of 1939 to 40 passed, the winter of the so-called Pony War. The general staff and high command group all knew what the plan was. They had all been told to attack ruthlessly at the first opportunity, to smash the French and English forces, to pay no heed to treaties with or the neutrality of the Low Countries. Breaking of the neutrality of Holland and Belgium is meaningless. No one will question that when we have won. That is what Hitler told the Oberbefehlshaber. The generals and admirals agreed and went forward with their plans. Now, it is not true that all the steps in this march of conquest were conceived by Hitler and that the military leaders embarked on them with reluctance or misgivings. To show this, we need only hark back for a moment to what Mr. Elwin Jones told the tribunal about the plans for the invasion of Denmark and Norway. The tribunal will recall that Hitler's utterances in October and November, which I have just read, although they are full of threatening comment about France and England and the Low Countries, contain no suggestion of an attack on Scandinavia. Indeed, <clears throat> Hitler's memorandum of 9 October from which I read, L-52, affirmatively indicates that Hitler saw no reason to disturb the situation to the north, because he said that unless unforeseen factors appeared, the neutrality of the northern states could be assumed. 
the trade could be continued with those countries, even in a long war. But a week previously, on the 3rd of October, 1939, the defendant Raider had caused a questionnaire to be circulated within the Naval War Staff, seeking comments on the advantages which might be gained from a naval standpoint by securing bases in Norway and Denmark. That document is C-122-GB-82. And another document introduced by Mr. Elwin Jones, C-66, which is GB-81, shows that Raider was prompted to circulate this questionnaire by a letter from another admiral named Carls, who pointed out the importance of an occupation of the Norwegian coast by Germany. Admiral Carls, Rolf Carls, later attained the rank of Admiral of the Fleet and commanded Naval Group North, and in that capacity is a member of the group, as defined in the indictment, as well as Raider. The Tribunal will also recall that the defendant Dönitz, who at that time was flag officer submarines, replied to this questionnaire from Raider on 9 October 1939. The document in question is C5, GB 83. And Dönitz replied that from his standpoint, Trondheim and Narvik <coughs> met the requirements for a submarine base the Trondheim was better, and that he proposed the establishment of a U-boat base there. The next day, Raider visited Hitler. And this visit and certain subsequent events are described in a document which has not previously been introduced. Now, Your Honors, <coughs> owing to a confusion in numbering, the German document is C-71, but the translation appears in your books in document L-323, and that will be U.S. 541. The translation will be found in L-323. the middle of the page, entitled, Entry in the War Diary of the Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, Naval War Staff, on Vezeribu, that being the cover name for the operation against Norway and Denmark. The diary entry for 10 October 1939. <clears throat> First reference of the Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, Naval War Staff, when visiting the Fuhrer, to the significance of Norway for sea and air warfare. The Fuhrer intends to give the matter consideration. Entry for 12 December. Fuhrer receives Q and H, those being presumably Quisling and Hagelin. Subsequent instructions to the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces to make mental preparations. The Commander-in-Chief of the Navy is having an essay prepared, which will be ready in January. If I may interpolate, the translation of the next sentence is somewhat in error and should read, with reference to this essay, Kapitän Zerse Kranke is working on Weseribung at OKW. During the time which followed, 
H. Hogland, maintain contact with the Chief of Staff of the Commander-in-Chief of the Navy. His aim was to develop the Party Q, Quisling, with a view to making it capable of making a coup and to give the Supreme Command of the Navy information on political developments in Norway and military preparations, military questions. In general, he pressed for a speeding up of preparations, but considered that it was first necessary to expand the organization. I think that is all that I need read of that. Another document, which is C64, GB86, already in the record, shows that on 12 December, the Naval War Staff discussed the Norwegian project with Hitler. I'm not going to read from that document, Your Honor. At a meeting which the defendants Keitel and Yodel also attended. In the meantime, Raider was in touch with the defendant Rosenberg on the possibilities of using Quisling. And Mr. Elwin Jones very properly pointed out to the tribunal the close link between the service chiefs and the Nazi politicians. As a result of all this, on Hitler's instructions, Keitel issued an OKW directive on 27 January 1940, stating that Hitler had commissioned him to undertake charge of preparation for the Norway operation, to which he then gave the code name Vezerubu. And on 1 March 1940, Hitler issued the directive setting forth the general plan for the invasion of Norway and Denmark. That is C-174, GB-89, which Mr. Jones put in the record. The directive was initialed by Admiral Kurt Fricke, who at that time was head of the operations division of the Naval War Staff, and who at the end of 1941 became chief of the, Na of the Naval War Staff, and in that capacity is a member of the group as defined in the indictment. So, as these documents make clear, the plan to invade Norway and Denmark was not conceived in Nazi party circles or forced on the military leaders. On the contrary, it was conceived in the naval part of the general staff and high command group. And Hitler was persuaded to take the idea up. Treaties, neutrality, meant just as little to the general staff and high command group as to the Nazis. As for the Low Countries, neither Hitler nor the military leaders were disturbed about treaty considerations. The Tribunal will remember that at the conference between Hitler and the principal military leaders in May 1939, as shown in document L79, US 27, already in the record, when the attention to attack Poland was announced, Hitler, in discussing the possibility of war with England, <clears throat> said that the Dutch and Belgian air bases must be occupied by armed force. Declarations of neutrality will be ignored. And that later, in his speech to the Oberbefehlshaber in November 1939, Hitler said that they must first invade the Low Countries, and no one would question that when they had won. Accordingly, <clears throat> one can well imagine that the winter of 1939 to 40 and the early spring of 1940 was a period of very intensive planning in German military circles. The major attack in the West through the Low Countries had to be planned and the attack on Norway and Denmark had to be planned. The defendant Yodel's diary 
for the period 1 February to 26 May 1940. That is 1809 PS GB 1119 contains many entries reflecting the course of this planning. Some of the entries have already been read into the record. Others are now of interest. The tribunal will see from these entries, which have already been read, that's got to go up, yes, that during February and early March, there was considerable doubt in German military circles as to whether the attack on Norway and Denmark should precede or follow the attack on the Low Countries, and that at some points <clears throat> there even was doubt as to whether all these attacks were necessary from a military standpoint. But the tribunal will not find a single entry which reflects any hesitancy from a moral angle on the part of Yodel or anyone else that he talked to to overrun these countries. I will make several references now to document 1809 PS and several of the entries in it. Do not plan to quote verbatim at any length. The court will note that on 1 February 1940, General Yashanik, the chief of the air staff and a member of the group as defined in the indictment, visited Yodel and made a suggestion that it might be wise to attack only Holland on the ground that Holland alone would offer a tremendous improvement for Germany's aerial warfare. On 6 February, Yodel conferred with Jeschanik, Varlamont, and Colonel von Waldau. And what Yodel calls a new idea was proposed at this meeting that the Germans should carry out actions H, that being Holland, and the Weser exercise, that being Norway and Denmark, only, and should guarantee Belgium's neutrality for the duration of the war. I suppose the German Air Force may have felt that the occupation of Holland alone would give them sufficient scope for air bases for attacks on England, and that if Belgium's neutrality were preserved, the German bases in Holland would be immune from attack by the French and the British armies in France. If to meet this situation, the French and British attack through Holland, through Belgium, the violation of neutrality would be on the other foot. But whether or not this new idea made sense from a military angle, it appears to be an extraordinary notion from a diplomatic angle. It was a proposal to violate, <clears throat> without any excuse, the neutrality of three neighboring small countries and simultaneously to guarantee the neutrality of a fourth. What value the Belgians might have attributed to a guarantee of neutrality offered under such circumstances is difficult to imagine. And in fact, the new idea projected at this meeting seems a most extraordinary combination of cynicism and naivete. In the meantime, as Yodel's diary shows, on 5 February <coughs> 1940, the special staff for the Norway invasion met for the first time and got its instructions from Hitler. From Keitel. From Keitel, I beg your pardon. On 21 February, Hitler put General von Falkenhorst in command of the Norway undertaking, and Jodl's diary records that Falkenhorst accepts gladly. On 26 February, 
Hitler was still in doubt whether to go first to Norway or the Low Countries. But on 3 March, he decided to do Norway first and the Low Countries a short time thereafter. This decision proved final. Norway and Denmark were invaded on 9 April, and the success of the adventure was certain by the 1st of May. The invasion of the Low Countries took place 10 days later. So France and the Low Countries fell. Italy joined the war on the side of Germany. The African campaign began. In October 1940, <coughs> Italy attacked Greece. The Italo-Greek stalemate and the uncertain attitude of Yugoslavia became embarrassing to Germany, particularly because the attack on the Soviet Union was being planned, and Germany felt she could not risk an uncertain situation at her rear in the Balkans. Accordingly, it was decided to end the Greek situation by coming to Italy's aid. And the Yugoslavian coup d'etat of 26 March 1940 brought about the final German decision to crush Yugoslavia also. The documents have already been introduced by Colonel Fillimore, and there is little that I need to add for my present purposes. The decisions were made, and the armed forces drew up the necessary plans and executed the attacks. The onslaught was particularly unmerciful and ruthless against Yugoslavia for the special purpose of frightening Turkey and Greece. The final deployment instructions were issued by Braukic and appear in a document which has not been read before, <coughs> that being R95, go up, GB127. Two extracts from this are of interest. R95. These extracts are very short. The political situation in the Balkans, having changed by reason of the Yugoslav military revolt, Yugoslavia has to be considered as an enemy, even should it make declarations of loyalty at first. The Fuhrer and Supreme Commander has decided, therefore, to destroy Yugoslavia as quickly as possible. Then, turning to paragraph five, numbered five, timetable for the operation. On 5 April, as soon as sufficient forces of the Air Forces are available and weather permitting, the Air Forces shall attack continuously by day and night the Yugoslav ground organization and Belgrade. The end of the quotation. The German attack on the Soviet Union, <clears throat> I have a little more to say about. All the documents showing the aggressive nature of the attack have been put in by Mr. Alderman. I suppose it is quite possible that some members of the general staff and high command group opposed Barbarossa as unnecessary and unwise from a military standpoint. The defendant Raider so indicated in a memorandum he wrote on 10 January 1944, that is C-66 GB-81. C-66 is the translation. This is the 
only document I propose to read on this subject, from which a few extracts are of interest. <clears throat> Quotation starts at the very outset of the document C-66. At this time, the Fuhrer had made known his unalter unalterable decision to conduct the Eastern Campaign in spite of all remonstrances. After that, further warnings, if no new situations had arisen, were found to be completely useless. As Chief of Naval War Staff, I was never convinced of the compelling necessity for Barbarossa. And passing to the third paragraph, the Fuhrer very early had the idea of one day settling accounts with Russia. Doubtless his general ideological attitude played an essential part in this. In 1937 to 38, he once stated, that he intended to eliminate the Russians as a Baltic power. They would then have to be diverted in the direction of the Persian Gulf. The advance of the Russians against Finland and the Baltic states in 1939-40 probably strengthened him in this idea. and passing to the very end of the document, paragraph 7, page 4. As no other course is possible, I have submitted a compulsion. If in doing so, a difference of opinion arises between one SKL, that, if I may interpolate, <clears throat> is a division of the Naval War Staff having to do with operations, it is perhaps because the arguments the Fuhrer used on such occasions, paren, dinner speech in the middle of July to the Oberbefehlshaber, to justify a step he had planned, usually had a greater effect on people not belonging to the inner circle than on those who often heard this type of reasoning. Many remarks and plans indicate that the Fuhrer calculated on the final ending of the Eastern Campaign in the autumn of 1941, <clears throat> whereas the Supreme Command of the Army was very skeptical." End of quote. That, to be sure, indicates division of opinion as to the military chances of a rapid success. But the part last quoted, indicates that other members of the group favored Barbarossa, and Raider's memorandum actually says substantially what Blomberg's affidavit said, to wit, that some of the generals lost confidence in the power of Hitler's judgment, but that the generals failed as a group to take any definite stand against him, although a few tried and suffered thereby. Certainly, the high command group took no stand against Hitler on Barbarossa, and the events of 1941 and 1942 do not suggest that the high command embarked on the Soviet war tentatively or with reservations, but rather with ruthless determination backed by careful planning. The plans themselves have all been read or cited to the court previously. That concludes the evidence on the criminal activities of the group under counts one and two. The documents written by the military leaders from which I have read and which had previously been introduced <clears throat> are not the writings of men who were reluctant to plan and execute these manifold wars. I want to make clear again the nature of the accusations against this group under Counts 1 and 2. 
They are not accused on the ground that they are soldiers. They are not accused merely for doing the usual things a soldier is expected to do, such as make military plans, command troops. It is, I suppose, among the normal duties of a diplomat to engage in negotiations and conferences, to write notes and aid memoirs, to entertain at dinner parties, to cultivate goodwill toward the government he represents. The defendant Ribbentrop is not indicted for doing those things. It is the usual function of a politician to draft regulations and decrees, make speeches. The defendants Hess and Frick are not indicted for doing those things. It is an innocent and respectable business <clears throat> to be a locksmith, but it is nonetheless a crime if the locksmith turns his talents to picking the locks of neighbors and looting their homes. And that is the nature of the charge under counts one and two against the general staff and high command group. The charge is that in performing the functions of diplomats, politicians, soldiers, sailors, or whatever they happen to be, they conspired to and did plan, prepare, initiate, and wage illegal wars and thereby committed crimes under Article 6A of the Charter. It is no defense for those who commit such crimes to plead that they practice a particular profession. It is perfectly legal for military men to prepare military plans to meet national contingencies. And such plans may legally be drawn whether they are offensive or defensive in a military sense. It is even perfectly legal for military leaders to carry out such plans and engage in war if, in doing so, they do not plan and launch and wage wars which are illegal because they are aggressive and in contravention of the Charter. I am very far from saying <clears throat> that there may not be individual cases involving some individual members of this group where drawing the line between legal and illegal behavior might not involve some difficulties. That is not an uncommon situation in the legal field. But I do not believe that there is any doubt or difficulty here before this tribunal as to the criminality of the general staff and high command group as a group under counts one and two, nor as to the guilt of the five defendants who are members of the group. In the case of the defendants Goering, Keitel, and Yodel, the evidence is voluminous, and their participation in aggressive plans and wars is more or less constant. Same is true of Raider and his individual responsibility for the aggressive and savage attack on Norway and Denmark is particularly clear. The evidence so far offered against Dennis is less voluminous for the reason that he was younger and not one of the top group until later in the war. But numerous other members of the general staff and high command group, including its other leaders, are shown to have participated knowingly and willfully in these illegal plans and wars. Braukic, commander in chief of the army, his chief of staff, Halder, Varlamov, the deputy to Yodel. In the nature of things, these men knew all that was going on and participated fully, as the documents show. Reichenau and Sparrow helped to bully Schuschnigg. Reichenau and von Schobert, together with Goering, are immediately sent for by Hitler 
when Shishnagord is the plebiscite. At a later date, we have seen Blaskovitz as an over the fails harbor in the field, knowingly preparing for the attack on Poland. Field Marshal List, educating the Bulgarians for their role during the attacks on Yugoslavia and Greece. Von Falkenhorst, gladly accepting the assignment to command the invasion of Norway and Denmark. On the air side, Yashanik has been recorded proposing that Germany attack Norway, Denmark, and Holland, and simultaneously assure Belgium that there is nothing to fear. On the naval side, Admiral Karls, a member of the group, foresees at an early date that German policy is leading to a general European war. And at a later date, the attack on Norway and Denmark is his brainchild. Kroenke, <coughs> later a member of the group, is one of the chief planners of this attack. Schneewind is in the inner circle for the attack on Poland. Fricker certifies the final orders for Wezerubo. And a few months later, proposes that Germany annex Belgium and northern France and reduce the Netherlands and Scandinavia to vassalage. Most of the 19 officers I have mentioned were at that time members of the group as defined, and the few who were not subsequently became members. At the final conference for Barbarossa, 17 additional members are present, and at the two meetings with Hitler, at which the aggressive plans and the contempt for treaties were fully disclosed, the entire group was present. The military defendants will perhaps argue that they are technicians. This amounts to saying that military men are a race apart from and different from the ordinary run of human beings, men above and beyond the moral and legal requirements that apply to others, incapable of exercising moral judgment on their own behalf. What we are discussing here is the crime of planning and waging aggressive war. It stands to reason that that crime is committed most consciously and culpably by a nation's leaders. The leaders in all the major fields of activity, which are necessary to and closely involved in the waging of war. It is committed by propagandists and publicists. It is committed by political leaders, by diplomats, by the chief ministers, by the principal industrial and financial leaders. And it is no less committed by the military leaders. In the nature of things, planning and executing aggressive war is accomplished by agreement and consultation among all these types of leaders. And if the leaders in any notably important field of activity stand aside or resist or fail to cooperate, then the program will at the very least be seriously obstructed. That is why the principal leaders in all these fields of activity share responsibility for the crime, and the military leaders no less than the others. Leadership in the military field, as well as in other fields, calls for moral wisdom as well as technical astuteness. I do not think that the responsible military leaders of any nation will be heard to say that their role is that of a mere janitor or custodian or pilot of the war machine which is under their command, and that they bear no responsibility whatever for the use to which that machine is put. The prevalence of such a view would be particularly unfortunate today when the military leaders control forces infinitely 
more powerful and destructive than ever before. Should the military leaders be declared exempt from the declaration in the Charter that planning and waging aggressive war is a crime, it would be a crippling, if not fatal, blow to the efficacy of that declaration. Such is certainly not the view of the United States. The prosecution here representing the United States <clears throat> believes that the profession of arms is a distinguished profession. We believe that the practice of that profession by its leaders calls for the highest degree of integrity and moral wisdom, no less than for technical skill. We believe that in consulting and planning with the leaders in other fields of national activity, the military leaders must act in accordance with international law and the dictates of the public conscience. Otherwise, the military resources of the nation <clears throat> will be used not in accordance with the laws of modern society, but the law of the jungle. The military responsibility with other leaders. I use the word share advisedly. Obviously, the military leaders are not the final and exclusive arbiters. And the German military leaders do not bear exclusive responsibility for the criminal holocaust which was committed. But the German military leaders conspired with others to undermine and destroy the conscience of the German nation. The German military leaders wanted to aggrandize Germany <clears throat> and, if necessary, to resort to war. As the chief prosecutor for the United States said in his opening statement, the German military leaders are here before you because they, along with others, mastered Germany and drove it to war. Your Lordship, that concludes the evidence under counts one and two. If this would be a convenient stopping point. Uh, you've got another branch of the argument. Counts three and four, Your Honor, which will take considerable time. Yes, sir. Very well. We'll adjourn now. <laughs>